and welcome to Simpler Bible, a daily journey to biblical understanding. Today, we're going to talk a little bit more about Ahab. So, while Elijah is cool, Ahab, definitely not. This is episode 136, 1 Kings 21 and 22. Pick up with me in 1 Kings 21, verse 1. Now, Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard in Jezreel beside the place of Ahab, king of Samaria. And after this, Ahab said to Naboth, Give me your vineyard that I might have it for a vegetable garden because it is near my house and I will give you a better vineyard for it if it seems good to you or I'll give you its value in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. So keep in mind the northern kingdom is really about 10 tribes. Uh, the southern kingdom has Judah and Benjamin, but mostly Judah. And, and, and so you were forbidden, according to the Jewish law, you were forbidden from transferring your inheritance from one tribe to another. So Ahab is of the tribe of Ephraim. We're not told who Naboth is, what tribe he's of, but clearly it's a different tribe because he goes, far be it from me that I should give my ancestral inheritance to you and forsake uh, the inheritance of my fathers. Verse 4. So Ahab went to his house, vexed and sullen, he's a crybaby, he's pouts, because of what Naboth the Jezreelite had said to him, for he said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed, and he turned his face away and would eat no food. I, I, I just need you to see this grown man, who's a king, howling because he couldn't have the piece of land next door for a vegetable garden, and he goes into his room, and he turns his face to the wall, and he's like, oh, you know, I just pouty and won't eat. I, and if you want to know, I picture, uh, is, it, uh, is it King John from the animated um, Robin Hood? You know, the lion, and he's like pouting and he's sucking on his thumb. Like That's what I picture here, Ahab doing that. That's exactly the picture in my head. And so he's just, oh, I'm so sad. I can't have that vineyard next door, just big crybaby. But Jezebel, his wife, com comes to him and says to him, why is your spirit so vexed that you eat no food? And he said to her, because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, give me your vineyard for money or else if it please, I got to sound like whiny, right? If it please you, I'll give you another vineyard for it. And he said, I won't give you my vineyard. Jezebel, his wife said to him, do you not now govern Israel? She's like, are you not a king? She's like, are you kidding me with this? Are you not a king? Arise and eat bread. Let your heart be cheerful. She says, I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal. And she sent the letters to the elders of the leaders who lived with Naboth in his city. And she wrote in the letters, proclaim a fast and set Naboth at the head of the people and set two worthless men opposite him. Now, that should make you think of Deuteronomy 17 and Deuteronomy 19. It might not yet, but by the time we get to the end of the Bible, it will. Because according to the Jewish law, you could not uh, charge someone as guilty without the testimony of at least two witnesses. So she says, set two worthless men opposite him and let them bring a charge against him saying, you have, he has cursed God and the king, then take him out and stone him to death. So the men of the city, the elders and the leaders who lived in the city did as Jezebel had said, and they sent word to them or as Jezebel had sent word, and it was written in the letters that she had sent to them. And they proclaimed a fast and set Naboth at the head of the people. And the two worthless men then came in and sat opposite him. And the worthless men brought this charge against him in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth, curse God and the king. And so they took him outside, and the city stoned him to death with stones. That was how easy it was to put a, a man to death. It's why they were looking, it, it's why when it's talking about, we'll get into this in the Gospels, but I'll, I'll tease you with it now. It's, it's why when they're trying to put Jesus to death, it makes a point of saying, but no one's testimony against him agreed. They couldn't find anybody to agree. Finally, two men come forward to make this accusation against Jesus. And so the Jewish law forbids that anybody be put to death on the testimony of one man. Keep that in mind. Then they sent to Jezebel and said, Naboth has been stoned and now he is dead. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was left for dead, Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. Now this is interesting because this would imply at least a little bit that Naboth didn't have any kids, that he wasn't married because it should pass on to his kids. So it, according to the, the Jewish law, it passes first to your sons. And if it, you don't have any sons, then it passes to the the nearest person you have, your brother or, or something like that. And if you don't have a brother that's surviving, it passes to your daughters. But certainly there's somebody in Naboth's family that this should have passed to, but Ahab swoops in and takes it. 
And as soon as Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab arose to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, to take possession of it. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise and go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone to take possession. And you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Have you killed and also taken possession? And you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, In the place where your dogs where dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick up your own blood." So this will be fulfilled in 1 Kings 22, 34 through 40. And uh, we will also bump into this again, this story in 2 Kings chapter 9, but I'll remind you of that then. Ahab said to Elijah, have you found me, O my enemy? He answered, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring disaster upon you and I will utterly burn you up and cut off from Ahab every male bond or free in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, for the anger to which you have provoked me and because you have made Israel to sin. And Jezebel, the Lord uh, and of Jezebel, the Lord also says, the dogs will eat Jezebel within the walls of Jezreel. And that's fulfilled in 2 Kings 9 as well. Anyone belonging to Ahab who dies in the city, the dogs will eat. And anyone of his who dies in the open country, the birds of the heavens will eat. Now, there was none who sold himself to do what was evil on the side of the Lord like Ahab, whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. He acted very abominably in going after idols, as the Ammonites had done, whom the Lord had cast out before the people of Israel. And when Ahab heard those words... So this condemnation, this judgment of God, when Ahab heard those words, he tore his clothes and put it on sackcloth on his flesh, fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about dejectedly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring this disaster in his days, but in his son's days, I will bring this disaster upon his house. And so the, the decimation of the sons of Ahab won't happen in Ahab's days. Ahab will still die and his blood will still be looked up in the place where the dogs looked up the blood of Naboth. Now listen to this. For three years, Syria and Israel continued without war. But in the third year, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, so Judah's the southern kingdom, came down to the king of Israel. And you're going, what does it mean came down if Israel's the northern kingdom? Uh, everybody came down from Jerusalem. Jerusalem was kind of set on a hill. So Anywhere you went from Jerusalem was considered going down. And the king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us, and we keep quiet, and we don't take it out of the hand of Syria? And he said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me in battle against Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, and my people as you people, my, your people, and my horses as your horses. Jehoshaphat said to the king, Inquire first of the word of the Lord. So the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, says to Ahab, the king of Israel, but let's ask God first. I'm happy to go to war with you, but let's ask God first. Then the king of Israel gathered all the prophets together, about 400 men. These are prophets of Baal. And said to them, shall I go to battle against Ramoth Gilead or shall I refrain? And they said, go up. The Lord will give it into your hand. But Jehoshaphat said, is there not here another prophet of the Lord whom we can ask? I love this, right? So the two kings are sitting there and Jehoshaphat's like, Ahab, I'll go to war with you. Let's ask God first. And so Ahab asked his hundreds of prophets and they're like, oh, go to war. You're going to be victorious. And Jehoshaphat's like, uh, do you have anybody who knows the Lord that we could talk to? I love that, right? Jehoshaphat is kind of, he kind of walks the fence. He kind of tries to, to balance on both sides of it. Not ultimately great. But anyway, King Ahab in verse 8 says, there is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah, the son of Imla. But I hate him, for he never prophesies anything good concerning me, but only evil. And Jehoshaphat said, oh, don't say that. Then the king of Israel summoned an officer and said, bring quickly Micaiah, the son of Imla. Now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones, arrayed in their robes at the threshing floor, the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets were prophesying before him. Zedekiah, the son of Chinana, made for himself horns of iron and said, thus says the Lord, with these you shall push the Syrians until they are completely destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied and said, go up to Ramoth Gilead and triumph. The Lord will give you, give it into your hand. And the messengers who went up to summon Micaiah said to him, Behold, the words of the prophets are in one accord, and they are favorable towards the king. Let your words be like the word of one of them and speak favorably. But Micaiah says, As the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that will I speak. And when he had come to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall I go up to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I refrain? And he said, Go up and triumph, O Lord. Uh, triumph, for the king will... Sorry. Go up and triumph, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. So he agrees with what the other prophets are saying. And then listen to this, verse 16. 
But the king said to him, how many times must I make you swear that you speak nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Micaiah goes, okay. I saw all of Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each return to their home in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, didn't I tell you who wouldn't prophesy any good concerning me, but only evil? And Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord seated on his throne and all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab that he will go and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said one thing and one said another. And then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, by what means? And he said, I will go out and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. And he said, you will entice him and you will succeed. Go out and do so. So this lying spirit comes out from the presence of the Lord into the mouths of the false prophets of Ahab to lead Ahab into death. And it reminds me a little bit of 1 Samuel 16, where the harmful spirit of the Lord comes and causes uh, King Saul harm. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all your prophets, and the Lord has declared disaster for you. So this lying spirit has stirred up these false prophets to say, go, you're going to be victorious. Micaiah says, no, nah, this is God leading you to death. This is what God's going to do. He's bringing judgment on you. It's, it's what Elijah had already declared that Ahab was going to be brought to death. So then Zedekiah, the one who made the iron horns and said, you're going to win. You're going to defeat the army of, us, of the Syrians. Then Zedekiah, the son of Chinnah, came near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, how did the spirit of the Lord go from me to speak to you? So like, I don't know, this is just funny to me. So like you got 450 prophets with clearly this one guy that's in charge. And then you got Micaiah, the only prophet for the Lord in the room. And, and he, and Micaiah says, yeah, these guys are all lying by a harmful spirit and you're going to go into a war and you're going to be killed. And, and Zedekiah comes up to Micaiah and slaps him. And he's like, well, when did the spirit leave me to go to you? And it's just a little bit comical. I don't know, like this super tense moment, right? So Micaiah says, behold, you shall see on that day when you go into an inner chamber and hide yourself. And the king said, seize Micaiah, take him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, thus says the king, put this fellow in prison and feed him with meager rations of bread and water until I come in peace. Micaiah said, if you return in peace, the Lord hadn't spoken by me. Hear all you peoples of Israel. So he says, put this guy in prison, feed him with meager rations until I come back from the Lord or come back from war. And Micaiah goes, look, if you come back from, the, from war, God didn't speak through me. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up with Ramoth Gilead. Now listen to this. This is insane. Why does Jehoshaphat agree to this? Listen. And the king of Israel, Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, I'll disguise myself and go into battle, but you wear your kingly robes. And the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. So Ahab has been told, you're going to die in battle. Ahab says to the other king, they have unique horses, they have unique chariots, they have unique garments. He goes, I'll tell you what, I'm just going to dress like one of the normal guys. You dress like a king. Tells Jeho like, what's he hoping here? He's hoping that Jehoshaphat's going to be killed and Ahab's going to be spared. Like, that's what he's hoping. And somehow Jehoshaphat goes along with it like an idiot. Now, the king of Syria had commanded the 32 captains of his chariots fight with neither small nor great, but only with the king of Israel. And when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they said, surely it's the king of Israel because he's dressed like the king. And they turned to fight against him. And Jehoshaphat cried out. And when the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him. And I love verse 34, right? Ahab's out here going, good. No one, I'm not drawing any attention to myself. I look like one of the normal guys. I'll just stay out of the outskirts of the battle, whatever. Look at verse 34. But a certain man drew his bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the scale armor and the breastplate. So some dude in the Syrian army just pulls his, his bow and arrow back and lets an arrow fly at random. He's not aiming at anything. And that's the arrow that comes between the breastplate and the scale armor of, of, the, of the king and pierces his side. And I just think it's comical. Like Ahab's doing everything he can, right? But this randomly fired arrow takes Ahab out. And therefore he said to the driver of his chariot, turn around and carry me out of the battle for I am wounded. The battle continued that day and the king was propped up in his chariot facing the Syrians until at evening he died and the blood of his wound flowed into the bottom of his chariot. And about sunset, a cry went out through the, out the army. Every man returned to his city and every man to his country. So the king died and was brought to Samaria and they buried the king in Samaria. And they washed his chariot by the pool of Samaria and the dogs licked up his blood and the prostitutes washed themselves in it according to the word that the Lord had spoken the previous chapter, 1 Kings 21, 19. 
Now the rest of the acts of Ahab and all that he did, the ivory house that he had built and all the cities that he had built, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Ahab slept with his fathers, and Ahaziah his son reigned in his place. Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, began to reign over Judah in the fourth year of Ahab king of Israel. He was 35 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 25 years. He walked in all the way of Asa his father. He did not turn aside from it doing what was right in the sight of the Lord, yet the high places were not taken away, and the people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places. Jehoshaphat also made peace with the kings of Israel. Um, Jump down here to verse 51. Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel and Samaria in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and he reigned two years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he walked in the way of his father, Ahab, and in the ways of his mother, Je- Jezebel, and the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. He served Baal and worshipped him and provoked the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger in every way that his father had done. So two kings going two different directions. And and we will pick up tomorrow. Let's see where we're going to be tomorrow. Tomorrow we are going to be in 2 Kings 1 and 2. And we're going to say goodbye to Elijah. See you then. Thank you so much for joining with us today at Simpler Bible through another section of scripture where we come to know and understand God a little bit better. Look, if you're brand new to Simpler Bible, we have all sorts of resources available for you. Go to our website, simplerbible.com, and there you can find these videos, you can find our podcast, you can find links to our social media, and you can even find a blog post with additional scriptures if you want to go into a little bit more study than we had time to cover in this podcast and video today. We hope that this tool will be exactly that for you, a tool. Not something that replaces your daily walk with God, but something that enhances your daily walk with God and helps you to know and enjoy Him more. Thank you so much for being part of this, and we'll see you again tomorrow.